often with a binary outcome, we use uh, ratio scale, sometimes um, sort of for interpretative ease, sometimes because the study design effectively um, re requires it. Um, in the case of uh, mediation, it's also going to correspond most naturally to what comes out of, um, of regression models. Um, but the same ideas essentially carry over from the different scale to the ratio scale. So we can define, for example, uh, the controlled direct effect on an odds ratio scale as it's going to be this contrast of um, the two same counterfactuals, y1m versus y0m. Fix the mediator to m, change the exposure from 0 to 1. But now, rather than looking at the difference between those two counterfactual outcomes, we're considering the um, odds of the outcome if we fix the exposure to 1 and the mediator to m versus the odds of the outcome if we fix the exposure to 0 and the mediator to m. But we could define sort of controlled direct effect on an odds ratio scale the same way, same contrast uh, of two counterfactuals, but now on an odds ratio scale. And likewise, we can do the same thing for the natural direct uh, and indirect effects. Um, for the natural direct effect, it's again the same two counterfactuals, y1, m0, y0, m0. Fix the mediator to the level it would have been in the absence of exposure, that's m0. Change the exposure from 0 to 1. But now the odds of the outcome in each case, rather than simply taking the difference. And likewise, for the natural indirect effect, same two counterfactuals, y1m1, y1m0. Fix the exposure to 1, change the mediator from what would have been in the absence of the exposure to what would have been in the presence of ex the exposure. Um, so same two counterfactuals, but again, now on the odds ratio scale. Um, and importantly, when we've moved to the odds ratio scale, the total effect odds ratio now decomposes into the product of the natural direct and indirect effect odds ratios rather than the, the sum. And we'll come back to this point a little bit later as well. Um, so our definitions are analogous, but now on the odds ratio scale. Um, and we can do the same sort of regression-based approach. Um, we could fit a, with a binary outcome, we could fit a logistic regression for the outcome, now allowing for exposure mediator interaction. If the mediator is continuous, we could fit a linear regression model for the mediator. We'll come to the case of binary mediators a little bit later. We can do the same thing. And then one can show that provided the outcome is rare, and we'll come back to this point, but provided the outcome is relatively rare, maybe less than 10%, and the models are correctly specified, now with m normally distributed, we'll come back to that as well. We didn't need that in the case of linear regression. Um, so with m, our mediator normally distributed, then under confounding assumptions 1 through 4, the natural direct and indirect effects on the odds ratio scale are given by these expressions here for the log controlled direct effect, not log natural direct effect, log natural indirect effect, given by these expressions here. Once again, just combinations of the regression coefficients of the two regressions. And in fact, the controlled direct effect and the natural indirect effect looked exactly as they, as they did before. Same combination of coefficients. The natural direct effects, a little more involved and now also involves sigma squared, the variance of the error term in the mediator regression model. Um, so the, the, when, we, when we move to odds ratios and logistic regression, the expressions become a bit more um, involved. But again, the, the principles are the same. It's just sort of the output from the two regressions that give us our direct and indirect effects. That normality assumption for, for m, that m needed to be normally distributed, we didn't need that with continuous outcomes. And in fact, the only time we need it is for the natural direct effect when we have interaction, exposure mediator interaction. We don't need it for the control direct effect. We don't need it for the natural indirect effect with or without interaction. We don't need it for the natural direct effect without interaction, but we do need that normality assumption for the natural direct effect when we're allowing for exposure mediator interaction to get the mathematics to work, to get simple expressions when we do the sums, the integrals, um, we need that assumption.
as before, it's relatively straightforward to give standard errors um, for these expressions using the, uh, using the delta method. The expressions look very similar to what they did before. Again, we're not going to spend much time on this because the macros will do this automatically. Yep. Yeah. 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 So we'll describe a simulation approach, which you can make the modeling as flexible as you want. But to get to these closed form analytic expressions, that's for the natural direct effect with the interaction. That's where you need the normality assumption. Why do we outcome as rare? And outcome as rare, then the estimation of these equations depend on a particular task. Um, you, you need sort of a larger sample size. I mean, the sort of 10% sort of cutoff is what's often used in the simulations we've done for the direct and indirect effects. Performance is pretty good. Even up to maybe 15%, it sort of begins to degrade uh, quite noticeably uh, after that. And that's because these are, these are essentially, uh, you, you need that rare outcome assumption essentially, again, to get closed form expressions. Um, uh, and we'll come back to the reason why in perhaps slightly more intuitive terms a little bit later. Um, but again, it's to get those closed form expressions. But there's nothing in principle that restricts you. You could use sort of more of a simulation based approach, which does the sum or the integral numerically, um, and drop that assumption. OK, so these results have presupposed a rare outcome. Um, for non-rare outcomes, uh, the same approach works, the same formulas work for a common outcome if you replace the logistic regression with a log binomial model. Those models don't always converge um, um, because the predicted probabilities don't always lie in the range 0, 1. Um, but, but when, when, uh, when they do fit reasonably well, those same closed form analytic expressions will work with a log binomial model with the effects then interpreted on the log risk ratio scale rather than the log odds ratio scale. So we can do something similar with a common binary outcome using log binomial models. So let's spend a little bit of time talking now about what the product method and the difference method give us. We saw at the beginning, we discussed at the beginning that with a logistic regression, the product method and the difference method don't coincide. So when, when are they valid? Well, with these formulas that we had, if we ask what happens if there's no exposure mediator interaction, all of these terms go away. And we're actually left with just the same product method expressions before. Theta 1 for the direct effect, beta 1 times theta 2, effect of the exposure on the mediator times the effect of the mediator, and the outcome for the mediated effect. Um, so in the absence of interaction, this approach reduces to the product method. We had noted at the beginning of the course that the product method and the difference method do not always give the same estimates. They can diverge. However, it can be shown when the outcome's rare, relatively rare, the product method and the difference method will approximately coincide. So with a rare outcome, in the absence of interaction, the product method, the difference method, and this approach from causal inference all, all coincide. So when the outcome's not rare, that we can run into problems. But now knowing this, we can, we can state the conditions under which the difference method, put the mediator in, take it out, will give us valid estimates of direct and indirect effects. It'll give us valid estimates of direct and indirect effects when the model without the interactions correctly specified, when our four confounding assumptions hold, and when the outcome is relatively rare. Under those assumptions, the difference method gives the natural direct and indirect effects on the ratio scale. We can relax the third condition by using a log binomial rather than a logistic regression. We can relax the first by incorporating the interaction and using the more general formulas. And with sensitivity analysis, we'll be able to relax to a certain extent the second. 
So the problematic case, and this, this is pretty routine in the literature, is the application of the difference method with logistic regression when the outcome is common. Those estimates are biased. And essentially this has really nothing to do with mediation per se. It's because of logistic regression and odds ratios. It all relates to uh, odds ratios not being what's called a collapsible measure. Um, you can have, for example, a uh, randomized trial where the odds ratio um, for women is 2.8, the odds ratio for men is 2.8, and the odds ratio overall is 2.2. And that's not confounding. It's a randomized trial. That's just the property of odds ratios. Odds ratios are not collapsible. Even when they're the same across strata and there's no confounding, that doesn't mean you get the same odds ratio for the, for the population. If you look at randomized trial data with a relatively common outcome and you start controlling for covariates, what you find is that the odds ratio tends to increase the more covariates you control for. That's not confounding. That's the property of odds ratio not being a collapsible measure. It's not that one is wrong and one is right. It's that conditional odds ratios are not on the same scale as marginal odds ratios. Um, and so that, that's just a funny property of odds ratios in general. When the uh, outcome's rare, it basically goes away. Um, odds ratios collapse to risk ratios, it basically goes away. But with common outcomes, it's a funny property of odds ratios. And that introduces complications when the odds ratio scale is being used in mediation analysis. So essentially what can happen with a common outcome using logistic regression and the difference method as we put the mediator in the regression model maybe the coefficient of the exposure drops somewhat because of mediation because some of it's explained but goes up again somewhat because we've added another covariate namely the mediator and so it can look like the coefficient hasn't changed at all even though there is mediation and so you can be led astray with a difference method with logistic regression with a common outcome in that way. Um, one can show uh, that under some pretty mild assumptions you actually get a conservative measure of mediation using the difference method. Um, that, that difference between the coefficients with and without the mediator is conservative for the indirect effect. So if you use the difference method with logistic regression, and it looks like you have some evidence for mediation, you actually do have evidence, provided you've controlled for confounding. But if you use the difference method and it looks like you have no evidence for mediation, you can't say anything one way or another, because it could just be due to this non-collapsibility issue. The fact that the coefficient's going to go up again by adding another covariate to the model. The fact that marginal and conditional odds ratios um, are not interpretable on the same scale. There's a question? Yeah, more than 10% roughly is. Again, there's no hard, hard and fast rule, but 10% is generally the yeah, cutoff. Um, so again, we've seen a number of instances where you know, our traditional methods are, are fine, but sort of now we know the assumptions we're making. Here is one instance where things, current practice um, can, can really uh, go, go, go wrong. So this is an important issue to be aware of if you're sticking with the traditional methods. And again, it's not as though sort of the causal mediation analysis approach somehow solves the non-collapsibility of the odds ratio. It's an issue there, um, too. We needed the rare outcome. If we wanted to get rid of that, we either had to use log binomial models to work with risk ratios directly, or we'd have to use sort of a simulation-based approach. Um, it's just this, what we're dealing with is the, the properties of odds ratios. Any questions? Yeah, people have used the probit link instead of the logit. Um, the R package I'll be describing at the end of the lecture has an option for the probit link. Um, and um, in their package, you get estimates on the difference scale with a binary outcome. 
rather than a ratio scale. But yeah, people have used that. Okay. Um, so our discussion so far has really been restricted to cohort um, data, but can be used as well for case control uh, data with one slight modification. Um, so we've got our two regressions, our outcome regression and our mediator regression. If we have a case control um, sample where we oversample based on case status for outcome, our outcome y, um, then we know by sort of classic logistic regression results, Prentiss and Pike, that we'll get valid estimates of theta 1 through theta 4 um, from the case control study. We'll get the same odds ratio estimates that we would have obtained in a cohort study. However, we need to modify the mediator regression to take into account the um, case control sampling design because we've oversampled based on the outcome y, not, not based on the mediator. So we need to take that case control design into account with the mediator regression. This can be done potentially in one of two ways. Um, one of which is um, if we know the prevalence of the pi of the outcome, um, then we can fit a weighted mediator regression where we weight the cases by pi over p, where p is the proportion of cases in the actual sample, the actual case control study. And we weight the controls by 1 minus pi divided by 1 minus p. Uh, we're, and um, and uh, then uh, use robust standard errors to account for the, for the weighting. A simpler approach, though, is if the outcome's rare, the controls themselves will very closely approximate the distribution of the mediator in the population. If the outcome's rare, very rare, pi is going to be close to 0 the cases get almost no weight whatsoever. So a simpler approach is actually just to fit the mediator regression amongst the control subjects. And provided the outcomes rare, that will give a very close approximation to the distribution of the mediator in the, um, in the population. So if we do that, um, then we can proceed using the same formulas with, with our mediation analyses. Question? So the proportion at the end of follow-up who have the outcome. No, so this would be the, 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 the proportion in the population as a whole. So that's pi, and p is the proportion of cases in the study. Pi, the proportion in the population. p, the proportion in the case control study. Thank you for the clarification. Other questions? OK. Um, so the, the, again, the principles with the binary outcome and logistic regression are the same, but we've, we've seen some subtleties. The sort of the rare outcome issue dealing with case control samples. Another subtlety we have to deal with is sort of the proportion mediated measure. Um, it can be desirable to sort of express that proportion mediated measure on the different scale for reasons which we'll see uh, momentarily. And we can convert our ratio measures for the direct and indirect effects to a proportion mediated measure on a different scale using this formula here. To see how this works um, and sort of take a simple hypothetical example, let's suppose the unexposed risk of the outcome were 1% and that our natural direct and indirect effects were ratio of 9, risk ratio of 9, and of 2 for the natural indirect effect. Um, then the risk under the natural direct scenario, if we switched from being completely unexposed and having a mediator to what it would have been in the absence of exposure, to sort of the scenario when we, the exposure is present, but the mediator is fixed to what it would have been in the absence of exposure. Comparison of those two is essentially the natural direct effect. Um, that would increase the risk of the outcome from 1% up ninefold to 9%. That's, that's how we've defined our natural direct effect risk ratio. 
Um, so in the presence of the exposure with mediator fixed to what it would have been in the absence of exposure, the risk of the outcome would be 9%. If we then considered what the risk is if exposed, if the person's exposed and the mediator set what to what it would have been if the person's exposed, um, that's moving from here to here. That's our natural indirect effect. So that increases the risk by twofold further, from 9% up to 18% if the person's exposed. Person's unexposed, 1%. Person's Exposed, 18%, and if the person was exposed but had the mediator set to what it would have been in the absence of exposure, risk is 9%. So in this example, on the difference scale, 8 percentage points of the increase is due to the natural direct effect, a move from 1% to 9%. 8% is due to the direct effect. And 9%, 18 minus 9, 18% minus 9%, is due to the indirect effect which would give us 9% over a total of 17%. In other words, 53% of the effect is due to mediation on a different scale. And if we plug in 9 for our natural direct effect risk ratio, 2 for indirect effect, 9 and 2, what we get out is 9 times 2 minus 1 divided by 9 times 2 minus 1, 9 over 17, once again, 53%. So this formula here does this calculation automatically. But why this is important is because um, it can look very different if we're just working with ratios. It looked like 53% was mediated on the difference scale, but our natural indirect effect risk ratio was 2 and the direct effect was 9. It looked like the direct effect was much larger. What's going on here is the natural direct effect and the natural indirect effect are being calculated with different reference risks, different baseline risks. With the natural direct effect, our baseline reference risk was 1%, and we had a natural dir direct effect risk ratio of 9-fold, which increased the risk from 1% to 9%. With a natural indirect effect, we were using as our baseline risk to calculate the ratio 9%. It increased it twofold from 9% to 18%. But because they're using different reference risks, um, it can look like the natural indirect effect is much ratio is much smaller, um, even though the proportion mediated is really quite substantial. So this conversion sort of helps get around the problem. Again, it's not necessarily a problem if you just keep in mind that the 9 and 2 are working with different reference risks, but sort of easy to lose sight of that, um, easy for it to be misinterpreted, and so it can be helpful to convert to a different scale when reporting the proportion-mediated measure. And we'll see this in an example a little bit later on as well. To get around the four statistical properties, does it make sense to use the proportion-mediated purely descriptively as a way to get uh, achieve understanding, but use it if you're interested in statistical inference or testing to do it on the other, with the other measure? Yeah, so I mean, I, I tend to be in, in favor of reporting the natural direct and indirect effects with their confidence intervals and p-values if you want, and just a measure of the proportion mediated knowing it's highly um, inaccurate, because I think the confidence intervals almost contribute nothing. In many cases, you might as well just say 0 to 100 or minus 100 to, <laughs> uh, to, to, to 100, and basically just treating it as the calculation that someone's going to do in their head, even if you don't report it. Um, so that's, that's my view. Um, uh, I think there's sometimes pushback from journals, say. Everything should have a, <laughs> a confidence interval. Um, so you know, I'm not sure there's a right answer or a way to, to, um, to resolve it. But my view of the proportion mediated is principally, there, you know, there can be exceptions if you get very precise um, estimates, but it's principally just a back of the envelope calculation to give you some sense of the respected magnitudes. Um, it's, so it seems yeah. like with this example that you're sort of implying, it can be more intuitive or give a better sense of it, that it may make yeah. more sense or resonate more as what, what it's actually saying rather than the actual indirect effect yeah. itself. But that statistically, you maybe want to avoid the yeah. inference yeah. based on Yeah. 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 So I mean, there are two different, in, there are two different issues. There's inference on the one hand, and then there's communication on the other. And it's often, often tricky to, to, to balance that. 
Yeah, so it actually gets a bit subtle. There are a couple of different ways to define it, um, depending on, on precisely what, um, on what you mean. Um, so uh, what's sometimes done is the, um, uh, would be the um, total effect risk ratio minus the um, minus the controlled direct effect risk ratio divided by the total effect risk ratio minus one. Um, but there's a, an alternative way to also define it, and they can lead to slight, slightly different um, measures and and interpretations. It sort of uh, Let's see if I can remember this all. This is all in the in the book, but uh, I, I have not included it on the slides. Yeah, very good, very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can get the proportion eliminated on the difference scale as well, uh, on the ratio scale as well, and convert the ratios to a proportion eliminated on a different scale. But there are a couple of different conversions okay. possible. Okay, any further questions on sort of the, the methodology before we briefly talk about software? Okay, on we go. Um, so the macros I'll be describing here are currently available in, um, in SAS and SPSS uh, and in Stata. We'll describe an R package later on um, that uh, uses a different approach, a simulation-based approach to effect estimates. No one's yet uh, converted these macros in, into R, but I think it wouldn't be too difficult to do. Um, at present, uh, the macros handle continuous and binary mediators. We'll go through the formulas for binary mediators in a little bit. Uh, continuous, binary, and count outcomes. And um, actually, I think as a month ago, they've been extended now to time to event outcomes. So you can do this for proportional hazards models and accelerated failure time models as well. Um, and um, would work for randomized trials or cohort designs, unmatched case control studies. And, and actually, interpretation becomes a little tricky, but uh, to a certain extent, in matched case control designs as well. Um, if you do use SPSS, um, so, so we've got a um, tutorial paper that walks through some of the ideas we've been presenting here, but also uh, describes the macros in, in more detail. Um, this 2013 paper you can download from my website, and you can also get the macros from my website as well. Um, the one thing that's changed is um, in the tutorial paper, when walking through the SPSS macro, reference is made to C drive. The macro is wit written with SPSS version 19. Um, a few months later, they came out with version 20, and you are no longer allowed to save something to the, the C drive, so that needs to be modified. But that's in sort of a help readme file for the SPSS macro. But the, this is issues come up repeatedly, so I thought I would point it out explicitly if you do use SPSS. Um, the macro syntax is, is um, relatively uh, straightforward. You just sort of run the code, and then once you've done that, the mediation macro is just one line. Um, input the name of the data set, input the name of your outcome variable and Y var, exposure variable and A var, mediator variable and M var, um, and the, uh, the, all the covariates you want to control for in C var, you just give them in a list. Uh, sort of one slightly unfortunate feature with the macro is that categorical variables need to be recoded as a series of binary indicator variables, binary dummy variables for use in, uh, in the macro. Uh, neither I or the graduate student who worked on this are sort of statistical programmers, so this was, this was the best uh, we could do. Uh, SAS has expressed interest in taking this up, so hopefully some of these idiosyncrasies will eventually be gone, but right now you need to recode categorical variables as a series of binary indicators. Um, specify the exposure levels you want to look at, um, and A0 and A1. If it's binary, A0 would be 0, A1 would be 1, but otherwise you can compare any two levels. If it was continuous, 5 versus 20, say. Um, 
m is the level you want to calculate the control direct effect at. Um, so do you want to calculate the control direct effect setting the mediator to 0, setting the mediator to 10, setting the mediator to 2? You, you, you fix that, that level depending on what effect it is that you're interested in. Um, and c, and this again is sort of unfortunate consequence of uh, limited programming ability, and c is just the number of covariates that you've listed. So you just count them up. Um, binary, uh, the, the, uh, each binary indicator counts as, counts as one if you've recoded a categorical variable, but you just count them up, put the number in there. Um, y reg and m reg are the outcome model and the mediator model you want to use. So y reg can be specified as linear, log linear, logistic, Poisson, or negative binomial for count outcomes. Um, and now we can also do Cox and accelerated failure time. Uh, mediator is either linear or logistic for continuous or binary mediators. And then whether you want to allow for an exposure mediator interaction. You set interaction tr to true or false. Um, the output is then the results of the outcome regression, results of the mediator regression, and the estimates of the control direct effect and natural direct and indirect effects. So just given sort of a little hypothetical example here, we'll go through an actual empirical analysis, the example from genetic epidemiology shortly, but just to illustrate the output. Um, here there was no control for covariates, but any real analysis you would want to, because that's what you need to do to control for confounding, to make the confounding assumptions reasonable. Um, but in any case, Outcomes, first the output of the outcome regression. This is the exposure. This is the mediator. Therapy exposure is sort of a life uh, um, response to negative life experience is the mediator here. But th this is just SAS's linear regression output for the outcome. SAS's linear regression output for the mediator. You get the effect of the exposure on the mediator. And then um, the Control direct effects and natural direct effects and total effect along with standard errors, p-values, and confidence intervals. Um, in this case, if we first set the interaction to false, if we don't include the interaction, um, the control direct effect and the natural direct effect co coincide um, when there's no interaction. So here we had a... Um, Evidence for both a direct and an indirect effect, um, not allowing for the interaction, it looked like a little less than half might be, might be mediated. If we didn't do the same thing, but set interaction to true, the output for the outcome regression now includes an interaction term, in this case quite, quite substantial. And now, allowing for interaction, our control direct effect and our natural direct effect diverge, because we're looking at different effects here. Uh, natural indirect effects gone up quite substantially. The total effects, roughly what it was before. But now it looks like a much more substantial proportion of the effect uh, is mediated than when we ignored the interaction. So this would be a case where we would probably want to include the interactions in the final model. Again, in terms of deciding whether to include the interactions or not, I generally think it's best not to rely on the interaction p-value. Much better to fit it with, fit it without. If the results are quite different, then stick with the model without the interaction. Uh, sorry, with, with the interaction. If the results are quite comparable and the interaction estimate itself is quite small, then easier to report the results without the interaction just corresponds to the standard product and difference methods. Any questions on, on this? Yeah. Um, so that's the basic macro. There are a few additional options uh, with the macro. Um, the uh, one option is, is this output command. Um, and the default is reduced, in which case you get the Output given here, the controlled direct effect, natural uh, 
direct and indirect effect. Um, and you get those on average for the population, sort of evaluated at the average level of the population's covariance. That's what you get. If you want to get the conditional direct and indirect effects, sort of what are those effects for specific covariate values, uh, age 30, female, so on and so forth, um, then you can specify, specify output equals full. And that will then also give you um, the conditional natural direct and indirect effects at the covariate values that you specify. Um, so you just put in covariate values in the same order you listed the covariates, but the covariate values at which you want to calculate the direct and indirect effects. If you specify output equals full, you'll also get another set of effects, which I'll describe, uh, I think, in the next slide. But we'll, we'll hold off on that for, for one more slide. So that's output equals full. You don't need to specify output equals full or reduced. Default is reduced. That'll be the sort of most straightforward to interpret. When you set output equals full, you get a bunch of different effects. We'll go over some of those in more detail. So that's one option. When you put output equals full, you also have to specify C, the covariate set, which you want to calculate the conditional effects. Uh, second option is to do bootstrapping for standard errors rather than the um, analytic delta method standard errors. Usually once you're in the sample size of sort of five, 500, the two or more, the two coincide fairly um, closely. But with small sample sizes, um, it's better to use the bootstrap standard errors because the delta method standard errors really only apply to large sample sizes. Um, also, if you use a log linear model for a common binary outcome, it's best to do the bootstrapping for standard errors because of the convergence problems that can sometimes arise with the um, log binomial model. So small sample size or common binary outcome with log linear model, you should use bootstrapping. Otherwise, the analytic standard errors are fine and are obtained much more quickly. So that's the bootstrapping option. The default is to do 1,000 bootstrap samples for the confidence interval, but you can change that. You could specify 5,000 or some other number just by setting boot equals the number of samples you want. And then the final option for the macro is the case control option. If one specifies case control equals true, the macro will treat the data as having arisen from a case control study and the mediator regression will consequently just be fit amongst the control subjects. Um, so, so again, that can be used as well. Questions? Yeah? Uh, the output, that's output really to the list file. It's not output to a data set, or is it output? Yeah, output to, your, yeah, to the list file. The questions? Mm -hmm. For common uh, binomial uh, models, uh, Yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's a good question. I think one could try something similar as sometimes what's done, but um, uh, I don't. I don't know in the context of mediation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, would one could look at that. Um, if you use state of the state of commands, almost exactly the same. Uh, you don't have to specify the number of covariates in stata, but otherwise it pretty works, pretty much works the same thing, and same same in SPSS as well. Okay, um, so before we we move on and, and tackle a, an a, um, empirical example, one final, somewhat subtle. Um, conceptual point which, which was brought up earlier in one of the questions, which is a potentially different way to do the decomposition, to do the, the coding. So the effects um, we've been considering so far for the natural direct effect, fix the mediator to what it would have been in the absence of exposure, M0, change the exposure from 0 to 1. Natural indirect effect, fix the Exposure to one, change the mediator from what would have been in the absence of exposure to what it would have been in the presence of exposure. Now, um, so in the Robbins and Greenland in their original paper called what we've been calling the natural direct and indirect effects, terminology introduced by Pearl, they called them the 
gets a little confusing. The pure direct effect, it's the pure direct effect, and, and what's especially confusing is this was the total indirect effect. So wh why did they sort of append these additional pure and, and total pieces? Well, if we think about the direct effect, we've changed the exposure from 0 to 1 and fixed the media to what it would have been in the absence of exposure. That's what we've done. But we could instead consider changing the exposure from 0 to 1 and fix the mediator in both cases to what it would have been in the presence of exposure rather than it would have been in the absence of exposure. This is again a sort of direct effect because we're keeping the mediator at the same value for each individual at least, in each individual, and we're just changing the exposure. So it's still a sort of a direct effect, but we're fixing the mediator to something different here, m1 rather than m0. But we could do that instead. And likewise, for our natural indirect effect, we've fixed the exposure to 1 and then changed the mediator from what would have been the absence of exposure to the presence of exposure. We could instead fix the exposure to 0 rather than 1, but then do the same thing, change the mediator from what would have been the absence of exposure to the presence of exposure. And this, again, would sort of correspond to some type of mediated effect. We would still have a partitioning of the total effect. y1 is just y1m1, y0 is y0m0. Now if we add and subtract y0m1 rather than y1m0, um, we get a decomposition of our total effect into these alternative direct and indirect effects. And so Robbins and Greenland called this the total effect in a direct effect as opposed to the pure direct effect, and this the pure indirect effect as opposed to the total indirect effect. So why this pure and total? Um, essentially what's going on here is these are different ways of accounting for individuals where there's mediation and there's also interaction. Individuals, if you go back to the table, um, way back in the first set of, of lecture notes, if we go back to our table, individuals like individual 3, where the exposure does change the mediator, and um, the mediator has an effect on the outcome, at least in the presence of exposure. It doesn't in the absence, but it does in the presence. For an individual like that, we might ask, is this Mediation, or is this a direct effect? Well, in some sense it's mediation. The exposure changes the mediator. And changing the mediator goes on to change the outcome. So in some sense it is mediation. But in another sense it's also direct. I mean, we've got, um, we've got an interaction here. Um, we, even if the mediator is present, we need the exposure for the outcome to occur. So what do you do with someone like this when there's both mediation and interaction? Do you say this person, this is an instance of mediation, or do you say this is an in instance of a direct effect? And what these two different decompositions do is they answer that question in the two different ways. The one we've been using answers the question, no, this is mediation. The exposure changes the mediator, and that change in the mediator goes on to change the outcome. It's mediation. That's the decomposition we've been using. The alternative decomposition says, no, I don't care. It's direct. We're going we're gonna to call this person direct. Um, and it does the decomposition in that way. And there's not really a right answer. It's just how you do the accounting for individuals like this when there's both mediation and interaction. If you want, you can actually even separate them into, into their own group. Um, that, that, that can be done as well. But the decomposition we've been using um, is the one that's become standard in the literature. And that's because essentially if what we're interested in is mediation and capturing the full extent of mediation, then we want to call those individuals where it's both mediation and interaction. We want to count them amongst the mediated types. Um, but if you made a decision to do to, not to do so, that would be that would be fine as well. But this this decomposition
which attributes these mediated interaction type individuals to the indirect effect, to the mediated effects, what's become standard in the literature. It's what most of the software packages rely on. But if you specify output equals full in the macro, you'll get both deep composition. So you can look at them both. The terminology of Robbins and Greenland, the pure and the total, that was to account for who gets, which of the effects gets the mediated interaction type. Um, with the decomposition we've been using, the indirect effect does, so that's the total. That, it gets more of it. It's the total indirect effect. The pure doesn't get it. With the alternative decomposition, it's the total that gets the mediated interaction. Total direct effect. The pure indirect effect doesn't. So that's what the pure and the total were meant to sort of correspond to. But sort of having a total indirect effect gets a bit confusing. And so I think the terminology natural direct and indirect effects are what has become more standard um, in the literature. And it's this decomposition that we've been using that attributes the mediated inter interaction type individuals to the indirect effect that has likewise become standard. I realize this is all a bit subtle, a bit unfortunate, nearly impossible to put into um, an empirical um, paper, but unfortunately this is sort of the, the realities of um, trying to ask these types of questions about pathways in the presence of both mediation and interaction. When that's the case, these subtleties do arise and there's sort of no way around them except to explicitly um, uh, acknowledge them and to, 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 to be um, aware of them. In the absence of interaction, everything collapses. Uh, the pure and the total coincide. We only get one direct effect, one indirect effect. It's all fine. But in the presence of interaction, when we're also interested in mediation, we, we end up with these, um, with these subtleties. Again, one way around it is simply to rely on what has become the default. And it's become the default because it attributes to the indirect effect the full extent of mediation. Questions on this? Yeah. operationalizing these assessments of interaction that are so dependent on scale. And what worries me is this, when you use the word attribute, as though you can actually attribute this to one place or another, when you can have interactions popping up yeah. just because of discrepancies or the specification yeah. of scale. I mean, I'm very interested. In fact, I partly I do what I do because I'm interested in making, being able to test ideologic hypotheses, but I've almost given up on it because of this issue about scale. So yeah. If you want to set it aside and say, I don't want to answer that now, fine. But I, this, it's the operationalizing that's problematic. It's trying, every, all the decomposition makes sense. But then when we want to extrapolate from it, it becomes more problematic. Yeah. So I can go into that, but it's, it would take quite a long time. So I'm happy to talk uh, further with you, with you afterwards. Um, for most of the course, we're just treating interaction as a statistical concept, a product term in the statistical model to allow for additional modeling flexibility. There are more causal notions of interaction which we're, which we're touching upon here. Individuals like individual three who would have the outcome if and only if both the exposure and the mediator were present and would not in any of the other scenarios. Um, I teach a whole other course on, you know, on, on that, but we just we don't have time to go through those uh, details. But um, very recently, last year, um, put together a paper that tries to um, sort of encapsulate both concepts within a, within a single framework. You can actually do sort of a four-way decomposition, the proportion attributable to just mediation, just interaction, both mediation and interaction, and neither mediation nor uh, interaction. And I think that sort of helps to separate the concepts and also gain maximum insight. That material is published. It's on my website, including software to, to implement. It's also described in, in, the, in the book, but we just we won't have time to go through that here. Yes? Yeah. Measured over time in a sort of long, repeated measures. Yeah. Sense. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's right. So. 
Yeah, they, they do. So everything we've done is assuming an outcome defined at a fixed period of, of follow-up. So a, um, a single either binary or continuous outcome. So it's longitudinal just in the sense that the exposure precedes the mediator, which precedes the outcome. Um, but we're not dealing with multiple outcome measurements, multiple mediator measurements. Um, in the fourth section of the course, we'll talk a little bit about time to event outcomes, where we say, at what time does the event occur? Um, and there are now some methods for addressing um, repeated measured outcomes and doing mediation analysis in those contexts. That literature is still um, developing. We won't be covering it here, but some of those methods are now available. Yes? This question pertains to the macro, uh, where when you say for the case control, the mediator only, the regression is for the control. But in one of the slides you said you have to weigh the outcomes by their proportion. What's the. Yeah, so um, weighting the um, cases in the controls by those weights will give you a more exact estimate. Uh, but if the outcome's rare, Fitting the mediator model amongst the controls will give you a very, very close approximation. Um, because if the outcome's rare, the cases are going to get almost no weight. So that's just a more straightforward way to go about it. OK. Further questions or ready to move on? OK. So we'll spend a little bit of time now seeing how, how do these methods work in practice? What sort of insights might they give us? And we'll return to that example from uh, genetic epidemiology. Um, so as a reminder, we had these three studies that found variants on chromosome 15 associated with lung cancer. Prior studies had shown that they were associated with smoking behavior, average number of cigarettes per day, say. Um, are the effects principally mediated through smoking, average number of cigarettes per day? Or are there other pathways to the studies thought um, primarily direct. One, perhaps it was primarily through nicotine dependence. How do we tell? Um, complicating things perhaps even slightly further here is that there was some evidence um, that the variant increased uh, vulnerability to the harmful effects of tobacco smoking. Those with the variant seemed to extract more nicotine and toxins per cigarette smoked. So some form of gene environment interaction here. But now we have methods that sort of can allow for um, differing effects uh, of, the, of, the, um, of smoking across uh, variant exposure. Um, the study population for this analysis is a case control study from Massachusetts General Hospital, about 18, 1,800 cases, 1,400 controls. Um, lung cancer case control study that began in 92. Uh, eligible cases were any person over the age of 18 with a uh, lung cancer diagnosis. And the controls were um, friends or spouses of cancer patients or um, friends or spouses of other surgery patients at the hospital. Um, controls that had a previous diagnosis of cancer other than non-melanoma skin cancer were excluded. Here are the sample characteristics for the cases and the controls. Um, probably unsurprisingly, cases smoked higher number of average cigarettes per day. Uh, were smoking for longer, slightly older, relevant here, uh, had a higher proportion of the genetic variants. This analysis here was just to replicate what had already been shown in um, the literature in those three um, GWAS studies using logistic regression to look at associations between lung cancer and um, the variants, along with uh, smoking intensity. Um, but sort of relevant here, we get an odds ratio of about 1.3 increased risk in lung cancer per variant. And this matched very closely the uh, three GWAS studies in um, 2008. I think the best estimates were about 1.3, odds ratio of about 1.3. Uh, we then looked at, and this was again just to replicate what had already been done, um, we looked at associations between cigarettes per day and the variants among smokers, because that's what other studies had reported. Uh, we won't be using this in our actual analysis, but other studies had reported this. We reported it too. 
um, and you get about um, one extra cigarette per day per variant allele. Um, and this, again, corresponded pretty closely to the estimates in the literature. There have now been very large meta-analyses which suggest the best estimate is about one cigarette per day per variant. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to apply our mediation techniques um, to try to see as best we can how much of the effect is mediated by average number of cigarettes per day, how much of the effect is through other pathways. But before we proceed with the analysis, we should think through our confounding assumptions. We need to control for exposure outcome confounding, mediator outcome confounding, and exposure mediator confounding. In the context of a genetic exposure uh, restricted to a single race ethnicity group, uh, assumptions one and three are generally thought to be perhaps not perfect, but, but not um, too un unreasonable. And the analysis here was restricted to, um, to Caucasians. So again, subject to no population stratification, we think we've got unconfounded effects of the variant on lung cancer and on the average number of cigarettes per day. Assumption two is that we've controlled for mediator outcome confounding. That might be less plausible here. We might think of common causes of smoking and, and lung cancer, um, maybe, uh, maybe socioeconomic status. We've included one measure of um, education, whether college degree was obtained or not, but that's it. So we might think um, that might be related to smoking and lung cancer. Likewise, the neighborhood someone lives in might, be, might affect both smoking and lung cancer. Um, smoking possibly through additional uh, cigarette advertising, maybe lung cancer independently through greater exposure to air pollution. So again, the second assumption we're may maybe somewhat less sure about, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that assumption. It's often the problematic one, mediator outcome uh, confounding. And finally, our fourth assumption was that there were no mediator outcome confounders that were themselves affected by the exposure, by the variant. It's probably plausible for something like uh, SES, education, neighborhood. Don't think the neighborhood someone lives in is likely affected by this uh, variant. Um, but something like smoking duration might affect um, both average number of cigarettes per day, which will be our mediator, and lung cancer, which will be our outcome. Um, it did, however, turn out with this data that there was no association between the variance and smoking duration. There was association between the variance and average number of cigarettes per day, but none between the variant and smoking duration. And the results in the models which did and did not control for um, smoking duration were, were in fact pretty similar. So can't be certain about assumption four. Um, probably assumption two is the more problematic one, at least in this context. Um, so, we've already, we already have results for our logistic regression model. We reported that. We got an odds ratio of 1.3. Um, we still need to fit sort of the, the um, mediator regression model on average number of cigarettes per day, taking into account the case control design. So we can either fit that model amongst the controls or using weighting. Results are pretty similar here in either case. And then we'll, we'll also um, go on to allow for exposure mediator interaction, interaction between the variants and smoking, and see if that changes anything. Um, so our mediator measure here that we're going to use is going to be the square root of the average number of cigarettes per day. This is to get it slightly more normally distributed. It's still not at all perfect by any means. Um, but slightly more normally distributed. Um, again, that assumption's only needed for the natural direct effect in the presence of interaction, but we're eventually going to be estimating that. So um, try to make it more normally distributed. The results are pretty similar regardless of whether you make the transformation or not. Um, and then more important, really, from an interpretive perspective, is that our mediator is average number of cigarettes per day. So at best, under, if all the assumptions hold, at best what we're going to be getting out is the proportion of the effect mediated through average number of cigarettes smoked per day. That's not necessarily all aspects of smoking. That wouldn't capture, say, depth of inhalation. Um, and that's just going to be sort of a 
feature of all mediation analysis. It's only going to be as good as the measures you have. At best, what you're going to get out is the effect mediated through your mediator uh, measurement, not necessarily all aspects of the construct. So we'll come back to that point a little bit later. OK, so when we fit our outcome regression, our mediator regression, amongst the controls or using the weighting approach, um, what we get out is that um, per variant allele, our natural direct effect odds ratio is about 1.35. In this interval, 1.2 to 1.5. Natural indirect effect odds ratio is quite small here, 1.01, 95% confidence interval, 0.99, 1.02. And our estimate of the proportion mediated on the risk difference scale, in this case, is 3.6%. Looks like most of the effect is direct, is through other pathways, not by changing average number of cigarettes per day. What happens when we allow for interaction? It turns out there's pretty strong evidence for interaction in, in this case. Uh, the estimates change a little bit, but not, not much. The natural direct effect odds ratio goes down a bit, 1.3. Natural indirect effect odds ratio goes up a little bit, um, but not at the second decimal place. Uh, still 1.01. .01. Confidence interval becomes a little wider. Proportion mediated goes up a little bit, not very much. 5.4%. It still looks like most of the effect is through other pathways. And our confidence interval for the natural indirect effect is pretty narrow in, uh, in this case. So whatever the effect is, and it's probably positive. I mean, we know that these variants increase smoking. We know that smoking causes lung cancer. So it, probably some of the effect is mediated. But whatever it is, it's a pretty small proportion of the effect. That's what the evidence seems to point to. Most of it seems to be through other pathways. OK, so let's go back to our assumptions now. What about confounding, mediator outcome confounding? Um, something like, like neighborhood. Well, in this example, at least, um, we would essentially expect that confounding to be positive. We'd expect um, something to increase the likelihood of both, not increase the likelihood of one and decrease the likelihood of another. If you think about SES or education or neighborhood, probably that's going to increase the likelihood of both. Intuitively, at least, um, what that will do to the estimate is it'll strengthen the relationship between the mediator and the outcome. So we're going to overestimate that relationship because of that positive confounding. That would essentially mean an overestimate of the mediated effect. The mediated effect is roughly the effect of the exposure on the mediator times the effect of the mediator on the outcome. If we've overestimated the effect of the mediator and the outcome, we're overestimating the indirect effect. But our indirect effect estimate was already pretty small. So if that's an overestimate, that would just lend further support to our conclusion that most of it seems to be through other pathways. And we'll be formalizing that sort of reasoning when we do the sensitivity analysis. But intuitively, confounding is probably still an issue here. But intuitively, in this example, we'd expect that actually to just strengthen our conclusion further, given how things have fallen out with the analyses. Um, so there probably is a mediated effect here. Again, these variants do affect smoking. Smoking um, causes lung cancer. But whatever that is, it's small. It's our best estimates, and we've got a narrow confidence interval. It's pretty small. Uh, there seems to be pretty strong interaction between the exposure and the mediator. But most of the effect is direct. It's not by changing um, the mediator value, not by increasing the average number of cigarettes per day. And in some sense, we could see that intuitively, perhaps, even at the very beginning, what the variants did was increase cigarettes per day by one. Pretty small effect. And just not enough to explain away an odds ratio with um, lung cancer of, of 1.3. And all the mediation analyses are doing, really, is just sort of quantifying that, that um, intuition. Um, those conclusions seem to be fairly robust to confounding. Measurement error might be more problematic here. Cigarettes per day is self-reported. Um, sub 
subject potentially to measurement error. That would intuitively weaken the mediator outcome relationship, which might lead to an underestimate of the indirect effect. And so we'll come back to that question in the third part of the course. When we talk about sensitivity analysis, we'll also address how do we do sensitivity analysis for measurement error. Um, final comment on this example is just that, um, again, we need to be careful with the interpretation because what we're getting out here is how much of the effect is mediated by average number of cigarettes per day. And what we have pretty good evidence for is that is not the principal pathway. But that doesn't exclude other aspects of smoking behavior, possibly something like depth of inhalation. If, the, if what the variants do is lead someone to more deeply inhale, um, that would lead to higher levels of nicotine and toxins extracted per, per cigarette and might explain more of, of, the, um, of the effect. So again, our analyses can be helpful in answering the question how much of the effect is mediated by this particular mediator, but we have to be careful in extrapolating those conclusions to other measurements or other mediators. Any questions on the example? Again, it's just to get some sense as to how these methods can be helpful in, in practice. OK. Um, a few further things before moving on. Um, first, we can do pretty much the exact same thing with a binary mediator. Um, with a binary mediator and, say, a continuous outcome, we could fit a logistic regression for the binary mediator. We can fit a linear regression for the outcome, including exposure mediator interaction. As before, if our confounding assumptions hold models correctly specified, our direct and indirect effects are just given by yet another combination of the coefficients of the two regression models. Different formulas, but same principle um, as before. And likewise, if both our outcome and our mediator are binary, can fit two different regression models, logistic regression models, allow for exposure mediator interaction. If our confounding assumptions hold, the models are correctly specified, then the direct and indirect effects are given by these expressions here. Different expressions, but same exact principle. Standard errors can again be obtained by the delta method. The macros will do this automatically. OK. So we'll conclude the second part of the course with a description of this um, alternative analytic way to obtain natural direct and indirect effect estimates. The concepts are basically um, the same, but how, how we do the analysis changes a little bit. We do it by simulation rather than obtaining um, the formulas directly. Um, uh, and this approach was developed in a series of papers by Kosuke May and colleagues. Um, they use slightly different formal identification assumptions, confounding assumptions. Um, but really, in practice, they, they sort of all amount to the, the same thing. So if you actually look at the technical assumptions, they, they describe them slightly differently. The counterfactual dependence assumptions, they describe them slightly differently than we have. And you can construct some obscure examples where one set holds and the other doesn't, or, or vice versa. But these are all highly contrived. Essentially, on any causal diagram, if one set holds, the other will as well, and, and vice versa. So we're, we're essentially making the same, at least on intuitive ground, same set of assumptions. No exposure outcome confounding, no mediator outcome confounding, no exposure mediator confounding, and none of the mediator outcome confounders affected by the exposure. So you can state them slightly differently, but you're essentially assuming the same, the same thing. So same assumptions. Um, consequently, same empirical formula for the direct, natural direct, and indirect effects. Um, but what we've been doing so far has been specifying a parametric regression model for the outcome, parametric regression model for the mediator. Go through some algebra, we get the exact formula for the direct and indirect effects. That's nice because we can just plug it in. It's pretty easy to do with software. The downside of it is any time we change one of these models, maybe we add um, a quadratic term for the exposure, or we add an interaction between the mediator and one of the covariates. Any time we change those models, we essentially have to do the algebra 
all over again. We can, we can do it in principle. There's, there's nothing that, that prevents us, but, um, but it's tedious. It's a, it's a lot of work. So we've done this for a number of standard cases, allowing for exposure mediator interaction. Um, it's straightforward to include covariate-covariate interactions, but once you start doing covariate exposure or um, quadratic terms for the mediator, you'd have to do the derivations all over uh, yourself. And that, again, that becomes tedious. Um, so what this approach of MA et al. does instead is you fit whatever model you want for the outcome. You fit whatever model you want for the mediator. You can make it very flexible. It can include splines. Um, and then rather than calculating these sums analytically, just do it by simulation. Simulate over and over and over again um, to, to, get, to get these um, averages. Um, so the, um, the details are, are in the paper, but basically you um, sort of bootstrap from the original, um, pop, uh, original sample. For each bootstrap sample, you fit a model for M, you fit a model for Y. For each possible treatment value, you simulate a value for M and a model for Y, conditional value of M you chose. And then you average over these to get the natural direct and indirect effects. You do this again and again and again and bootstrap to get confident confidence intervals, essentially. So essentially doing the sums and doing the confidence intervals by, by simulation and, uh, and bootstrapping. Um, and their R package does this automatically, and it does it for a, a very broad range of, um, of models. Um, and the approach could be extended um, more broadly yet. Um, they also have a Stata package. The options are somewhat more restricted, but I think, I think have expanded um, considerably. Um, there's another Stata package as well that does something, uh, something similar. Um, so again, the advantage is you can make the model as flexible as you want. You can include whatever interactions you want between covariates and the exposure and the mediator and still, um, still proceed with, uh, with this um, approach. Um, one other difference with, with the simulation-based approach, and this is really only a feature of the software. There's nothing inherently restricted to this, but the, the software they've implemented calculates all effects on a difference scale um, rather, than a, rather than a ratio scale. Someone else could, could edit their code and switch it to a ratio scale, but right now all effects are on a ratio scale and their code does not handle case control data. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, I think it's, you know, it's a very general, very flexible um, approach. The only real disadvantage is, um, is computational time. Um, you know, it, takes, it takes a whole lot longer in sort of moderate sample sizes with hundreds, thousands, maybe even up to sort of 10,000. It's, it's not too bad. Um, but we'll go over analysis in the next set of lecture uh, notes which consists of uh, 26 million US births. And once did a sort of back of the envelope calculation, which suggested it would take three years uh, <laughs> to obtain <laughs> an, an estimate using, um, using this package. So in, in that sort of setting, you'd really want to rely on uh, exact analytic formula. It took 10 hours with uh, SAS, but uh, that's a lot better than, um, than three years time. But otherwise, again, I think it's a very useful um, general alternative approach. Yeah? No. Um, I mean, that, that, that the methods themselves are still really under development. So I think as far um, as things are now, um, there are a couple of papers where you could fit standard repeated measures models for the um, uh, outcome and for the mediator, and then you'd have to combine the estimates you know, by hand or using a hand calculator and SAS, and, and likewise for the standard errors or bootstrap for the standard errors. Um, so probably there will be macro software available eventually, but uh, my, my guess would be we're looking at at least five years before something easy to use is ready. Yep? Can I go back to your question about the binary mediator? Yep. For those, the, the code for SAS and Stata, mm -hmm. is that just you can use MIRS or binary, that's fine? Yep, that's okay, right. And then does the, the, like what about when the mediator 
That's fine. That's fine. The only issue arises with a common outcome. Common mediator is fine. Yep, yep. Good, good question. Yep. I think it's just called mediation. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, and I think the same in Stata. Um, theirs is called uh, me mediation, as is the SAS and SPSS macros that we've done. Mediation was taken in Stata, so the fellow who coded our mediation package in Stata called it. Um, uh, Paramed, parametric mediation. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's that's what's uh, what's available at present. Yep. What if there are multiple mediators? Um, so there's no macros. There's some code available, um, uh, which you know isn't too hard to use. It's uh, copy paste, and then you have to edit a few different lines rather than just one. But it's it's yeah. It's not too bad. OK. Um, so in the second set of, of uh, the course, we focused principally on, um, on methodology and a fairly straightforward regression-based methodology. Um, we've been able to extend traditional approaches to allow for interactions. And we've also gained insight into when those traditional approaches do and do not work. We understand our confounding assumptions we need to make better. It's understood that we need to um, assume the absence of interaction if we're using the more traditional approaches. And with logistic regression, with a, we're, we're also assuming essentially that the outcome is rare. Otherwise, we need to, to make modifications. Um, we've seen how we can do this with case control data, how we can convert these measures for binary outcomes to proportion mediated on the risk difference scale. Um, and then, then we've also talked about this sort of flexible um, simulation-based approach that can be used with a, with a lot of additional um, models. So at least with the case of a single exposure, single mediator, single outcome, um, you know, the, the methodology is really quite um, well developed for the analysis. Um, for some of the other cases, um, although methods are now available, um, including to a certain extent with repeated measures or time to event, um, data, there, there aren't um, too many standard software packages yet. Again, we just recently extended the SAS macro, but only the SAS macro, not SPSS or Stata, to allow for um, Cox proportional hazards models and accelerated failure time models. So this, this field's been developing rapidly. The software tools have been advancing pretty quickly. But this is sort of where things are at in terms of um, easy to use macro software. But code, code is available for a number of the other cases. And I've said this before, but do want to emphasize again that with these newer approaches, we are not making stronger assumptions. It's not as though with the causal inference approach, we've got these four strong confounding assumptions. And with the traditional approaches, we didn't. That's not the case. The traditional approaches are making the same confounding assumptions. They're just often not acknowledged. Um, but it's the same assumptions that are being made if you're going to interpret these as actual effects. As, as causal effects. Um, and in some ways, we're relaxing the assumptions because we're allowing for greater model flexibility. Um, so the, the traditional approaches can be useful um, and I think are often helpful, but it's important to understand what's being assumed and when they break down. Any further questions? Okay. How are people feeling? Do you want to carry on for another 15 minutes, or are you ready for lunch? Why don't, why don't we just start? We'll do a very brief introduction to sensitivity <laughs> analysis. Because as tired as you may be right now, I can almost <laughs> promise that by the end of the day, you'll be yet tired or still. So um, let's, let's proceed just a little, little bit further. We won't do anything too heavy. Um, but that'll allow us to sort of uh, jump in more quickly after, uh, after lunch. So just 10, 10, 15 minutes, we'll do a brief introduction to sensitivity analysis. Um, we'll spend a bit of time. So, so I mean, the, the, the basic idea here is that we've been making strong assumptions. In just about any study, they will not hold. 
Um, and so it's important to ask the question, are our results robust to the assumptions we've made? Um, and this is more of an art uh, than a science, but I think it's important with observational data in general, and it's especially important with mediation analyses, because we've been making not just one, but several um, assumptions. And we'll go through a number of examples. We'll see that in some cases we can conclude, yes, our, our, at least our general qualitative conclusions, most of it's mediated, most of it's direct, large effects for both, at least in some cases our effects are quite robust to the violations of the assumptions. And we'll see other cases where it's not at all. And really at that point we have to throw up our hands and say we really shouldn't be drawing any conclusions about pathways, about mediation from the data. And I think it's really important to be able to distinguish those two scenarios, when we can reliably draw conclusions, when we can't. And, and of course, there's going to be intermediate ground as well. So that's really going to be the focus of this next section um, of the course. We're going to start um, just with an introduction for sensitivity analysis for total um, effects. Uh, this will sort of provide a nice pathway into direct and indirect effects, but I think these techniques are also useful in and of themselves. Um, out of curiosity, how many have sort of used or seen sensitivity analysis for unmeasured confounding in an observational study for total effects? Could I just get a show of hands? Yeah, so pr probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe a quarter. Um, but I think these should be used routinely as well uh, with observational studies, um, just when we're looking at the overall effect of an exposure on the outcome. So we'll begin with that. And that may turn out to be the most useful part of the entire course, in fact. Um, but we'll begin there. And then we'll move on to show how these same sorts of techniques extend to um, controlled direct effects, natural direct and indirect effects. Um, we'll talk about some other clever things one can do on the design side, like randomize both the exposure and the mediator and, and um, variations on that. And then we'll talk about some sensitivity analysis techniques for measurement error as well. Um, this literature has expanded considerably. I'm going to focus here on techniques which are easy to use, easy to implement, sort of can be done pretty straightforward way by hand. Okay, so we're going to start with total effects. Um, we, we probably won't finish our discussion of total effects before lunch, but we'll at least uh, um, begin. Um, so in any observational setting in which we're interested in the effect of an exposure and the outcome, we do try to control for as many common causes of the exposure and the outcome as we're able. But with observational data, we never know whether there might be another covariate affecting both the exposure and the outcome, which might bias our um, analyses. Sometimes we're aware of what that might be. Sometimes we've controlled for everything under the sun, but we still are never certain. And what sensitivity analysis techniques do is they allow you to assess the extent to which an unmeasured confounder would have to affect both the exposure and the outcome to completely explain away an effect. Um, they can also be useful in trying to assess sort of a plausible range of values for the effect of the exposure and the outcome. Uh, uh, sort of as they would range across plausible assumptions about the effect of the unmeasured confounder on the exposure and on the outcome. Um, and essentially what these techniques do is we compare the estimate controlling only for a measured covariate C to sort of the truth, what we would have obtained had we also been able to adjust for U. And we specify that difference or that ratio, we specify that relationship in terms of some sensitivity analysis parameters. We don't know what those are. We would only know what those were if we had data on U, which we don't. So we don't know what those are, but what we can do is we can vary those sensitivity analysis parameters and see how our effect estimate would then change. This is a very large literature sensitivity analysis for unmeasured confounding. Um, we're just going to focus here on a couple of pretty easy to use um, techniques. You'll sometimes see a distinction made in the literature between sensitivity analysis and external adjustment. Um, sensitivity analysis often being used to sort of varying the parameters and seeing how effect estimates change. External adjustment sometimes being used for when we take estimates from other studies which have measured our U, our unmeasured confounder, and use those to try to inform our current study. Sometimes that's called external adjustment. So um, a very early and relatively famous application of the sort of sensitivity analysis idea 
um, was the work of Cornfield and colleagues in, in uh, 1959 on the smoking lung cancer uh, association. So uh, the association was well documented, but it was thought that perhaps there wasn't a causal effect of smoking on lung cancer. Maybe this was due to confounding. Uh, rather famously, uh, Sir Ronald Fisher had proposed that perhaps a genetic variant affected both smoking and lung cancer and was responsible for the association. And sure enough, as we saw in our last um, set of lecture notes, Fisher was at least perhaps right. We do seem to have a variant that affects both smoking and independently lung cancer. But what Cornfield and colleagues did was they said, OK, let's suppose that such a variant did exist. How strongly would it have to affect both smoking and lung cancer to completely explain away that association, for that association not to be at all causal? And they showed for that to be the case, that variant would have to increase the likelihood of both smoking and lung cancer tenfold to explain away the association, at least tenfold to explain away the association. And that was just thought too high to be plausible. And so that sensitivity analysis really helped establish that the smoking lung cancer relationship was, was, was in fact causal. Um, and sure enough, if we look at sort of the associations we were getting with the variant we did identify, we we're getting odds ratios of 1.3 with lung cancer, not tenfold. And with smoking, it's much smaller even than that. Um, so again, the, although we can always, with observational data, raise the possibility of unmeasured confounding. What sensitivity analysis can do is say, well, how strong would that confounding have to be to explain away the effects? Um, we'll be focusing mostly here on unmeasured confounding bias, but it can use, be used for other types of bias, such as selection bias or measurement error. Um, we'll touch on measurement error at the end of um, this third portion of the course as well. Sometimes bias, the term bias analysis, is used to sort of describe the whole range of techniques. OK, um, so let's begin with a simple sensitivity analysis technique for risk ratios. Um, we're going to assume that if we could control for our measured covariate C and that unmeasured covariate U, we would have controlled for confounding. But our measured covariates alone, C, don't suffice. And we're going to define our bias factor on the ratio scale as the ratio between our observed risk ratio, using the observed data, just controlling for the measured covariate C, and the actual causal effect, the counterfactual causal effect. In other words, what we would have obtained had we adjusted for U as well. So the bias factor is the ratio between our estimate and the truth. And we're going to express that bias factor in terms of sensitivity analysis parameters. Um, then again, there are lots of different techniques out there. Um, we'll look at one which makes some simplifying assumptions, but essentially does that just to get very easy to use formula out. Um, so if we're willing to assume that u is binary, and the effect of u on the outcome, u on y, is the same for both exposed and unexposed. In other words, no interaction on the ratio scale between u and the exposure. So that our first parameter is just going to be gamma. Gamma is going to be the effect of u on the outcome on the ratio scale. Importantly, the effect of u on the outcome having already controlled for c, already controlled for our measured covariate c. So it's, it's only the effect of u on the outcome that's not picked up by our measured covariate. So that'll be important in the interpretation of the effects. So that's gamma. Um, and then under these simplifying assumptions, one can show that the bias factor is just given by this expression here, which involves gamma, the effect of the u on the outcome, and the prevalence of u amongst the exposed and the prevalence of u amongst the unexposed. So we don't know what those are. We have to specify them. But we have to specify three things, the effect of u on the outcome on the ratio scale, the prevalence of u amongst the exposed, and the prevalence of u amongst the unexposed. Once we've specified those things, we can calculate our bias factor. And we can then get a corrected estimate just by taking our observed estimate and dividing it by the bias factor. 
Under these simplifying assumptions, we can also get a corrected confidence interval by just taking our observed confidence interval from the observed data and dividing both limits by that bias factor. So it's relatively straightforward. We specify the three sensitivity analysis parameters, the effect of U on the outcome, prevalence of U amongst the exposed, prevalence of U on the unexposed. Plug those in the formula. We have the bias factor. We just divide the estimate in both limits of the confidence interval by the bias factor. It can be done by hand in, in a relatively straightforward way. We can then vary those sensitivity analysis parameters that we specified to see how much confounding would be needed to explain away the effect entirely. Um, we could try to use other studies to inform our specifications of those parameters. Uh, we could choose sort of a range of plausible values and report a range of corrected estimates to see how, how things change. Um, so we can do any of these things to try to get some sense on how robust our conclusions are to the possibility of unmeasured confounding. Any questions on the mechanics here? Yes? So uh, for the prevalence of uh, the unmeasured confounding in the exposure on the probe, can we reuse the data of our cohort to measure the prevalence of the exposure on the probe? Not if you don't if you don't have data on you, you can't you can't do that. We're assuming U is unmeasured. U is an unmeasured confounder, so we don't know what the prevalence is in the exposed and the unexposed. But if we assume that the highest covariate we have measured in our cohort, you Yeah, we'll we'll come we'll come back to that. The, I think we'll that'll have to wait till after the after the lunch break, but we'll come back to sort of ways where we can try to do this in a sensible, more objective manner. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that question. Um, let's briefly go through an example, um, and then we'll break for lunch. Um, so we'll, we'll look at um, some effects that have been reported in the literature of um, breastfeeding, maternal breastfeeding, on, on child and maternal um, outcomes. And the concern with a lot of these studies, uh, the, been reported, the effects have been reported on a wide range of outcomes, but the concern with a lot of these studies is that they're confounded by socioeconomic status. At least in the US, and this does vary across countries, but at least in the US, um, higher socioeconomic status women are associated with, with higher rates of, of breastfeeding. And often the control for SES in these studies are not, it's not particularly good. Um, so in one of these studies, um, those who were uh, breastfeeding at more than six months, um, their children had um, odds ratio, or 0.8 times lower odds of childhood leukemia. Um, confidence interval 0.7 to 0.9, highly, highly statistically significant p-value. Um, but let's suppose that we thought uh, low SES which was not controlled for in the analysis, increased the risk of childhood leukemia by something fairly moderate, maybe 1.5 fold. And that 30% of the breastfeeding group was low SES, but 70% of the non-breastfeeding group was low SES. All we do is we plug 1.5 as our effective U into the formula, 70%, 30%, calculate our bias factor, 0 0.85. We then divide our estimate in both limits of the confidence interval by 0 0.85 to obtain a corrected estimate and corrected confidence interval. The mechanics are pretty simple. But what we can see here is sort of relatively moderate confounding. This is not so substantial. Would explain away um, this effect. We don't know that it's confounding. It could, could be real, but the effect itself doesn't seem to be particularly robust. Uh, let's look at another example of breast, breastfeeding study. In this case, um, reference group was those breastfeeding uh, exclusively at four months versus not. Um, and in the, group, in the breastfeeding group, they were at 0 0.28 times lower odds of hospitalization for lower respiratory tract infection. Confidence interval 1.4 to 0.54. Now let's, let's consider a more extreme uh, confounding scenario. Maybe uh, let's suppose that uh, being in low SES group increased the risk of lower respiratory tract infection by threefold. 
and that 20% uh, of the breastfeeding group was low SES, but 80% of the reference group was, was, uh, was low SES, sort of a fourfold increase in risk of SES. If we plug those numbers in, we get a bias factor of 0.54. If we divide our estimate and confidence interval by the bias factor, we still end up with a corrected estimate of 0 0.52, confidence interval 0.26 to 1. So in this case, even under a really substantial confounding, um, sort of three, four-fold increases in risk, we'd, we still seem to have a, a evidence of an effect. Um, so we've seen two examples here where, I mean, one didn't seem robust at all. Uh, the other seemed strongly robust. If you just look at the p-values, they're both highly significant, sort of 10 to the minus fifth or something like that. Um, but, but they're very different in terms of robustness to potential unmeasured confounding. And of course, we might end up, and perhaps often will end up, with more intermediate cases. This was a similar study looking at um, breastfeeding and the odds of ovarian cancer um, in sort of the 6 to 12 month breastfeeding group, odds ratio of 0 0.5, confidence interval 0 0.3 to 0 0.8. Um, if we do the um, first confounding scenario with a 1.5 fold increase in risk of the outcome, 30 and 70 percent prevalences, bias factor of 0 0.58, corrected estimates 0 0.6, confidence interval uh, excludes zero still, but if we increase the confounding to maybe a, you having a 2.5 fold increase on the likelihood of the outcome, bias factor goes to 7.1, corrected estimate, still 0 0.7, but the confidence interval now does include um, one. So in this case, we can't necessarily be entirely confident, entirely sure. We seem to have evidence that it's robust to some confounding, but it is possible that uh, some combination of confounding and sampling variability led to an effect here where there, where there wasn't one. And that's really all sensitivity analysis is going to do. It's going to allow you to distinguish between those scenarios where it's really not robust at all, where it's really quite highly robust, and to these intermediate scenarios where we seem to have some evidence but aren't, aren't certain. Um, but just looking at the p-value. Uh, doesn't, doesn't do it. You can have highly, highly significant p-values in all cases, confidence intervals which exclude zero um, by a reasonable amount. Um, but these sensitivity analysis techniques, again, give you some insight into that. There are some objections to them, which we'll get to after the break, and some ways to try to do this more objectively. Um, we'll discuss that after the break as well. But this just gives you a basic flavor of how, how it, things work. Yes, question. Yeah, but yeah. No, so that, that would be one. I mean, if they were all fixed, then yeah. you would yeah. Say, yeah, let's yeah. No, so that would be one option. We'll talk through a few others, including sort of trying to use um, you know, expert opinion, which is problematic, but uh, can, can be used as well. Um, uh, we'll sort of use our observed data to see whether an unmeasured confounder would have to be even stronger than our most important measured confounder. That can be another way to try to make um, some progress. Another way to do it is just to sort of present a large table of, of values, including ones you think are highly implausible, and just sort of see where things uh, break, break down. So we'll go through um, some of those ideas after the break. Any questions about the basic idea or the mechanics on the ratio scale? OK, so with that, we will break for lunch. We'll be back in an hour. So why don't we say uh, 1.30?